Bye. Well, I appreciate people signing in on time. It's nice. Um, and I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, our next uh, speaker presentation uh, is February the 14th. And our previous past president, Wendy Shackwitz, will be giving a presentation on um, tricolored blackbirds. And she has aptly named that presentation. Hopefully I can find it right here. She's, uh, she's named it, I'll pull it up here, just a second. Um, she has named it, Do Blackbirds Sing in the Dead of the Night? So uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from Wendy. Wendy's gonna be back in town for a few days because uh, we're just about ready to begin uh, climate research for National Audubon. And she has uh, several of the uh, locations that she covers and she's flown back here from Texas and Seattle in order to uh, do the climate research with me. And um, Tom Slyker is gonna join me this year to learn about uh, climate research. And we have uh, David Leland from Sonoma that also helps uh, with some of our routes and Andrew Ford helps with some of the routes over in Solano County. Um, and I think there's several other people um, who I will forget everyone who participates in that. We have probably a team of about 10 people that work on climate research and it's, uh, it's great research. And they've been finding, uh, one of the findings so far is that um, some birds are adapting more quickly than others to climate change. And they're not, they're not sure yet. They haven't, um, they haven't reached any major conclusions about whether that means that they're more flexible and can survive. Um, in, in a more challenging environment or whether they're slower to respond and their populations may go down. So we're waiting to see that. Um, for climate research in our area, we are studying, uh, we're- Nobody's talking so far. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in, in our area, we are uh, doing five minute point counts in 12 different locations in about six different locations throughout Napa and Solano. It may be even 10 different locations. And um, it, during that five minutes, we listen for all the birds that are in a particular, within a hundred yards of our point. And our target bird is the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, other teams in the country are looking at Western bluebirds um, and other teams are working at things like painted bunting. So it depends on your location as to what birds people are um, monitoring specifically. But we look at all the birds and we see what the population is um, compared comparatively year after year. So it's, it's kind of like the Christmas bird count, uh, only it's done in point counts rather than every bird you can possibly see throughout the day. So, um, so Wendy will be speaking uh, the second Thursday of February, which is February 11th. Another upcoming event, um, we are tentatively planning our first spring field, field trip for February the 20th at Consumnus. And of course that's gonna depend on whether or not COVID restrictions get lifted some and uh, whether or not it's safe to do that. Um, I've now heard that people 65 and over can uh, get a vaccine. So be looking to get a vaccine if, uh, um, and keep yourself safe. That's the biggest thing. Keep wearing your masks and keep uh, social distancing and get a vaccine if you possibly can. All right, well, it's my pleasure folks to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Alvaro has been a friend of ours for several years. Um, Lucas and I have been going on pelagics for the last uh, six years, I think. And every year we try to go on one or two of Alvaro's. Um, we also go on pelagics uh, out of Bodega with Redwood Regional Ornithological. And even one of, Red, uh, of Lucas's friends set up uh, a November pelagic this year, which we braved and went out on. And uh, we've had fun on every single pelagic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the orca 
in the, my background was taken on one of Alvaro's pelagics uh, when we were out um, probably 20 miles out, I think. So um, Alvaro is a birder of great renown. Uh, he leads a, a, his organization called Alvaro Adventures that not only takes pelagics out of Half Moon Bay, but also does birding expeditions around the world. And I'll let uh, Alvaro um, speak more to that um, during his presentation. But um, without further ado, Alvaro, and I always butcher your last name, Alvaro. <laughs> Aramillo. Aramillo, there we go. Yeah. Okay, my son is now taking Spanish, so I have a chance of getting it right. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a, you know, it's a long name too. Actually, my name comes up in this talk. This is funny. So I'll, I'll explain what it means. <laughs> I'm going to put, uh, put uh, you in speaker view and then you will be the... Mark, Mark, one, one thing before we start. Yep. Can you ask uh, or remind everybody to mute their, uh, their yes. video, please? In, in fact, um, I will try to mute everybody. Let's see okay. if we can do that. Thank you. Yeah. Please mute your... Uh, your video, your audio. All right. Oh, shoot. Do you, do you see the, the screen? Everything okay there? Your side? I rent it. Okay. Damn. Well, um, thanks everyone uh, for yeah. inviting me to talk to you. Um, it's uh, yeah. kind of a... Uh, I can't change the audio volume because the audio volume thinks... Somebody's, you not, somebody's not muted there. Can we mute that? <laughs> Um, anyway, anyway, you know, this is a talk about birding in Mediterranean regions, but it's also, um, these are the wine growing regions uh, of the world and you guys are sort of smack dab in the middle of wine central, you know, in, in, in Napa. So I thought it'd be kind of an interesting thing to think about the environment wine birds all kind of in one talk that takes us to various places throughout, throughout the world. Um, but we, um... Elvaro, can you unmute yourself now? Sorry, I might be able to do it. Uh, you're going to need to unmute yourself because I. Oh, you muted everybody. All right, there. Everybody, there we go. Yeah, there we go. That's good. Um, so, the yeah, uh, let's start with. I got to click here before I can move. Okay, so uh, I was a kid when the whole medfly thing happened. And I was living in Canada at the time. And I, I mean, those of you who sort of lived it here, um, you know, uh, knew it was, a, it was a big deal, right? This, this fly, it was, you know, invading the, the orchards and, and, you know, everything was, uh, you know, millions of dollars of, of uh, could go down the drain unless you, you know, controlled this fly. But one thing that got to me, it was like, why was this thing called a medfly? the Mediterranean fruit fly. And why was it in California? I, at that point, I really didn't know enough about California, you know, being a kid. I always thought the Mediterranean was this place in Europe. And I didn't realize that also the Mediterranean was, it's a, it's a, it's a habitat, it's a, it's a weather, a climate zone. And it all now makes complete sense. It's so obvious, but, um, you know, it's similarly obvious when you start looking at weeds that, that are found in, in California, you know, some of them are South African, like, you know, like the, uh, um, this, um, oh, Cape, um, oh, what's it called again? Cape Ivy. And then others are European. And uh, if you go to places that share the similar climate, like Chile, you'll be surprised to find out that California poppy is an invasive weed over there. So there, there's hillsides that become orange. And of course, everybody goes to take pictures because it's beautiful, but they're not native plants over there. And, you know, here we have radishes and all these things from Southern Europe that are, are weeds. So it makes sense because we have this similarity in climate to the Mediterranean. And um, if you want to know where the Mediterranean zones are in the world, there are few of them, actually. Well, there's the Mediterranean, right? The Med, um, in, in Europe, North Africa. We are here in California, Chile. There's a little Mediterranean little pocket in southernmost South Africa and then bits of Australia. And um, 
it, you'll see that they're roughly in the same latitude. And, and this is, you know, I'll explain why that is. And if you think about the, from each Mediterranean region, if you go towards the equator from the Mediterranean regions, there's a desert. So there's a desert here, there's the Sahara here, there's the Atacama over here, you know, and, and deserts of, of Australia. And, you know, the Karoo region in, in South Africa, which is also desert and the Namib. So um, we are adjacent to deserts when you are in, in Mediterranean regions. And really basically what a Mediterranean climate zone is, is one that doesn't have a huge fluctuation in temperature. Um, so the, the winter is always colder than the summer, but they're not extreme fluctuations fluctuations like you get, you know, in, in North Dakota, for example. And all of the rain happens in the winter. So the cool season is wet and the, the, the hot season is really dry. And that mix does only happens in Mediterranean regions, right? Deserts are sort of dry all the time. Maybe there's a monsoon kind of period or something that happens. And there's areas that are wet all the time. Some that have, you know, two well, wet seasons and this and that, but having this situation where you're hot and dry in the, and then wet in the winter and cooler is the classic Mediterranean um, weather type. And it is perfect, of course, for grapes, having you know, all that water coming in, in in the winter and then in the summer when you have, uh, when you're trying to make a nice good wine getting the complexities in the skin of that wine, you need heat, especially in red wines, and, and that vine to be stressed somewhat, therefore, you know, being dry and warm is perfect for wine. So we have this correlation then of global wine regions being roughly where the, um, where the Mediterranean regions are. Now, wine growers have been really clever and have been able to expand the, the wine region. So now you're, you know, you can get wines from China and there are wines in parts of Brazil and, um, and Uruguay and so forth. And, uh, but for the most part, the real classic and the best places for wines are these, uh, the, the Mediterranean regions. And one of the reasons why California and Chile and South Africa, and of course, you know, Spain and France are so good uh, for wines. And that's, you know, the kinds of wines we buy and why, you know, we're not uh, going crazy, you know, tasting Canadian wines, although they exist. Um, and, you know, this is a, this is a kind of, you know, funky drawing that you might first get really confused about, but it's the earth. Um, and if you look at the line over here, that's the equator and the tropical air is warm, the poles are cold up here. And the earth has these general um, circulation patterns around it. And in places where the arrow is going down towards the ground, these are dry spots. And that where the air arrows is going up towards the sky, those are wet spots. So this is a wet tropical area. This is actually the, the desert areas um, is this dry, the polar deserts. And then we have a, a sort of um, subpolar or temperate low pressure system. And this low is wet and this high is dry. And the beauty of being in the Mediterranean system is that this whole thing shifts south and north depending on the season. So we essentially in, in winter, we're in the wet stuff. And in summer, the desert comes to us. So we're sort of flowing right in between these two, these two uh, circulation patterns. And um, it's kind of, it, it doesn't always work perfectly, but it's also the reason if you think about the, the, the wet area here in the tropics, this is one of, this, this also goes north and south uh, as you know, winter and summer happens. You're always in the tropics, but it creates the situation in many tropical regions that there are two wet seasons. There's usually a big wet season and a small wet season. And that's from that low pressure system kind of circulation pattern essentially going past a certain spot twice in one year. Um, so this is what roughly why the Mediterranean zones exist for, you know, in a very basic sense. And obviously you could 
poke holes into the details, but that, that's, that's roughly what's going on. And where we're gonna go in terms of looking at the birds, uh, these places is here, California, Chile, Spain, and South Africa. I'm not, I, I haven't been to Australia yet, so I don't have any pictures from the Australian part, but um, that's, that's the plan. This is a Cape rock jumper, one of the species that is found in South Africa. There's only, there's a very few, I think three species of rock jumpers that exist. They're a family on their own and they live in rocky areas are, rare to uncommon and just really good looking birds. And one of the highlights of, of birding in South Africa is trying to find a rock jumper. And it's one of the reasons why the, the tour company Rock Jumper is called Rock Jumper. It's, it's kind of their go-to fancy cool bird in, in South Africa. The, the habitats of these Mediterranean regions are su super similar, you know, and if, if you aren't a botanist from a distance, you wouldn't know necessarily which place is which. But here we are actually looking at um, chaparral in, in California, uh, matorral habitat in Chile, uh, maquis um, habitat in Spain, and fimbos habitat in South Africa. So shrubby habitats, um, you know, thickets, the, those are classic one of the classic habitats that shows up in Mediterranean zones. And for us, it's that chaparral. It's where the rent tits are. Is it's, you know, the, and it, you know, chaparral changes depending on how far north or how far south you are in California, but the general structure of a shrubby habitat is, is, the, uh, is the norm. If you think of the, the terroir, you know, the, the, how the land affects the grapes and therefore the wine, what we're talking about there is really endemism, right? And if you're thinking about birds, so, and then special, special birds. So each place has its own special wine. Um, Zinfandel, Carbonaire is Chilean, uh, Tempranillo, various uh, types of wine, of course, in, in Europe or Spain, or, and Pinotage in um, South Africa. And you can, of course, grow these grapes anywhere in the grape growing regions, uh, but certain places are known for their ability to really do them well. And in some cases, you're not allowed to take grapes outside of the country. They're really defensive over, you know, trying to maintain their, their own special um, brand of wine. And it's, it's like the birds. The birds are special to those habitats, to those climates, to those regions. And that's, those are the special specialities and they're also the endemics. So, you know, rent tit might be kind of the poster child for the chaparral area that you know where we live and in Spain you might see the Sardinian warbler with this black cap and ironically the Sardinian warbler is not that far away in relationship from the rented. The rented is now known to be in the group that includes the Sylvia warblers so um, it's it's interesting that they're actually kind of related to each other and in some of the the warblers relative relatives of the Sardinian actually kind of look like a rented um, and then in, in Chile, we have this big uh, tapaculo. It's a family of, of birds that tends to be very shy and little dark birds that live in the bamboo. But in Chile, they're huge and they actually walk around in the open kind of like quail. This is the mustache turca. And uh, here's the Cape sugar bird, uh, one of the families that's endemic to southern, um, to South Africa. And in particular, some of these shrubby areas where there's a lot of cool flowers is where you're going to find the, the sugar bird. And look at that long tail. It's got this massively long tail and um, some yellow colors and a, and a, and a little curved bill to actually poke around in, in, in flowers. That's why it's called the sugar bird. It's, it's nectaring, just like a hummingbird is. Um, in the north, in the northern hemisphere, in these Mediterranean habits, oaks are very important. So... In California, we have all of the various different species of oaks bordering around the Central Valley and creating oak savannas that are so important for a lot of our birds and in, including some of the birds that are the most special to California. And same thing, um, if you go to the Mediterranean in, in Europe, oaks are a big deal there in terms of habitat. And this is a habitat in Spain called a dehesa. And dehesa is really, um, unusual in some, in, in, in a particular way in that it's, 
it's a savanna, oak savanna, but it's managed and it has been managed for hundreds, if not thousands of years to raise a special pig that feeds on, on, the, um, um, on the acorns. And that black pig makes some of the sort of, it's known to have sort of the famous ham of um, some parts of Spain. And it comes from this habitat. So the habitat is actually managed for um, agriculture in a sense, yet it has masses of wild birds in it. It's, it's, a, it's a real sort of win-win where you can extract um, a, a product from it and you're also getting a lot of wildlife benefits from it. So it's Dehesa. And in, in these places in the North, jays and magpies are particularly um, interested in, in oaks, you know, so, such as our California scrub jay, or if you go to Europe, Eurasian jay, jays, magpies have a close association with oaks and acorns. And um, one really interesting one is one that you find in Spain in the Iberian Peninsula called the azure wing magpie. Now it's actually called the Iberian magpie. And you see it, it, it has this dark cap. It's kind of a dainty looking magpie with all blue all over the wing, you know, that's the azure and also the tails also bluish. But if you look at the map, they have these, a distribution that's completely disjunct. They're found in Asia. In fact, this picture over here was taken in Japan and this one's taken in Spain. They look very similar, these two birds. Um, in fact, you know, they, they were thought to be, um, people thought these things being so disjunct had to have been brought over by people. And even it was suggested that Marco Polo in his, in his original travel brought back magpies from either, you know, from the Iberian Peninsula to Asia or from Asia to the Iberian Peninsula. And um, for a long time, this was just a big mystery until DNA work was able to figure out how closely related those two populations of magpies were. And in fact, they're there's enough time difference in the, in, in the spread of the DNA and the difference that they could not have been brought by people. They, in fact, are two wild, isolated populations. And now they've been separated into two species. Um, one of them now called the Iberian magpie and the other one uh, called, kept the name Azure wing magpie. But at some point, maybe they stretched all the way through and they just became extinct in the middle. So interesting bird you see when you go to visit Spain in the oak woodlands um, and Portugal. Um, oak woodlands is really the place to see the uh, Iberian magpie. The oak also is important in, in Europe. The cork oak is the tree that was the original oak. In fact, cork comes from Quercus. Quercus is the genus of oak and also the old name in Roman times for oaks. So oaks equals cork. And in particular, you know, when you, if you go to places that harvest the cork for, for, uh, from, from the, um, the trees, this is what you see. And they are really old growth oaks that are maintained and will grow back the, the cork and are harvested. I don't, I don't know what the harvest times are, if it's 10 years, five years, what it is, but they reharvest them, so they maintain these big forests for cork oak, and um, I think that's that's kind of cool because it, they're actually really good habitat, and many of them are in Portugal, but there's also some of these uh, cork, cork oaks in in Spain that are harvested, and um, it makes you think that although you know the wine connoisseurs really like um, some of the aspects of these fake uh, corks, you know, and in, in, in maintaining the, the the wine for longer periods of time or the, you know, oxygen, the lack of, or the flow of oxygen or the speed of what have you. I do find that the beauty of, of having a real cork that came from a tree that is preserving birds is, is, a, is a cool thing that I, I, I would like to, uh, um, in a sense, I, I prefer a real cork in my wine, <laughs> my, my, my bottle. And I think of those birds that are using those, those trees in, in Spain or Portugal. And of course, you know, this sort of bird friendly stuff, um, coffee is, is one we we're really kind of familiar with, but I think it's gonna expand to all sorts of things. There's a bird friendly chocolate that's being started to sort of, uh, people are looking at how you would certify this. I think of maple syrup, you know, why buy 
you know, the, the it, maple syrup's more expensive, but when you're buying maple syrup, you're also preserving maple trees in Quebec and, you know, Vermont and so forth. But those are all habitats for birds. You know, those are probably areas that have black-throated blue warblers, you know, so it's, uh, I think of, you know, herring, Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts are actually pretty good during migration for, for birds to stop in here on the coast. So, you know, I think this whole idea of, of bird conservation through certain products, we're just at the start of it with this whole coffee thing, but, you know, cork, think about that. Um, California chaparral, we have a lot of really uh, unique birds and some of them are, you know, almost endemic in that, you know, they only peak into, um, either to Oregon or, or into uh, northernmost Mexico, like, you know, California thrashers, California gnat catchers. These are real specialty birds for people who don't live in California. Um, they're, they're the birds of the, that people look at in the field guides and say, boy, I wanna go there and eventually see these things that, that are so different from the birds I see in Ohio or, or Delaware. Our state bird, California quail is common in many places. Um, but it's it's a really kind of amazing bird if you look at it in, in in detail. And quails, these types of quails are only found in the New World. We happen to have the California quail. And weirdly enough, they were introduced to Chile. So in the in Mediterranean region, the climate region of Chile, California quail is abundant. They're all over the place, which is odd to think that you would introduce quail. Um, and when you go to those adjacent deserts, there often is a set of birds that's related to the set of birds that you find in the Mediterranean region, but are different species. So if we think of the California thrasher, go to the desert region, you have crystal thrashers. You have a California quail, you move a little further south or east and you get to the gambles quail as a desert species. And this happens all over where there's a Mediterranean region, you know, the same thing in, in South Africa and Chile, you can go farther towards the equator, get into the desert, and there's a whole other set of specialty birds really close and adjacent to Mediterranean, uh, the Mediterranean places that you're birding in. For us, oak birds are, are uh, near, some of them are actually almost entirely in California, like Nuttles, Woodpecker, Oak Titmouse, they just venture in, you know, just, just outside of the the state, um, so they're not truly endemic, found only in the state, but almost, like most of the world population of Nuttles woodpeckers and oak titmice are found in California and they're related to oaks. Again, this, this oak situation. Um, white-breasted nuthatches too. We, there are white-breasted nuthatches throughout North America, but they come in three different types with different call types and there's a thought of separating them eventually to different species. So here I actually have the California one and the Rocky Mountain one, or the mountain one. And the California version is really closely associated with oak forests. And it sounds different from the one that's in the mountains that tends to like pine. Although when you get further down into Arizona, they also will take oaks. Um, so we have a lot of uh, oak specialties. So it's chaparral and oak that, uh, that really make make the special birds of, of California outside of the marine birds. And then of course our endemic yellow-bell magpie, and I didn't show you the island scrub jay, also um, birds that rely on, on uh, the um, Mediterranean habitat and the magpies, uh, they like uh, oaks as well, of course. When we ship to Chile, you see if I showed you this picture, it could be somewhere in Southern California, it, this is just just um, up the hills from the big city of Santiago, where the capital city, and it looks very similar. Mountains are much higher, and you look around though, and some, you know, unless you recognize a, you know, something that's exactly the same as here, like the California quail that's been introduced, or a great egret, or a peregrine falcon, almost everything else is different. Um, the migrant shorebirds are similar, of course, but you will look around and see these little chicken-like birds if you're lucky, because they're actually quite shy, the Chilean tinamou, which is, I, I was gonna say, it's, they're related to the ostriches and rias. They're a kind of ratite um, and Chilean mockingbird. And the, the ratites are the most ancient lineage of birds that we know of based on DNA. Most of them are flightless, like rias, emus, um, um, cassowaries, kiwis, and ostriches, but these, Tinamous 
are the only group of ratites that actually can fly. And they're found throughout um, South America and, and some into Central America. They're often very hard to see. The Chilean one is a little easier than the forest ones because it's in chaparral type habitat and it comes out to sing at times. But um, the apart from looking generally li um, like kind of um, chickens, you know, or something like that, they're not related to grouse at all or to any pheasant. They're more closely related, like I say, to these big flightless birds. And the wonderful thing about tinamous is they have the most incredible eggs of any family of birds, you know, anywhere really. They look like they're they're made out of porcelain, shiny, and each species has a slightly different color. There's blue ones, green ones, these brown ones, depending on the on the species of tinamou. Um, they are so showy that back, I would say early 1900s, it was this industrious German fellow who took a whole bunch of tinamous back to Germany because he wanted farms. He, he, his idea, his business idea was big, massive tinamou farms where he could farm edible Easter eggs. So, so this was this idea. It, it failed, <laughs> but I could see where he got the idea. These colorful, beautiful, shiny eggs that you you know that the tinamous would lay for him. But tinamou breeding habits are are very complicated. The male does all the parental care, and it's uh, it wasn't so easy. It's not like uh, having chickens. Um, other Chilean specialties include uh, bird related to that turca I showed you before, the white-throated tapaculo, which looks like an overgrown wren, and then the cragchilia that looks almost like a, a canyon wren, to, uh, and it habits, um, its habits are like a canyon wren living in, in cliffs and, and rocky areas in the sort of mid-elevation of the Andes. The, um, instead of California thrashers, there's a bird that is not a thrasher, but it looks like one, although it's much, much smaller. It's this, this bird is sort of robin size, smaller than a robin, I would say, rather than, you know, thrasher size, a uh, scale-throated earth creeper. And it's part of a family that we don't have in North America, known as the Furnariads, sometimes known as the oven birds, although um, our oven bird is a warbler, not an oven bird like these birds. So, and rather, you know, I was showing you a a bunch of brown birds there. I thought I'd show you that not all birds in Chile are brown. There, there are some really colorful ones like the, the one on the left here is actually a flycatcher. So believe it or not, this bird is related to, you know, a um, willow flycatcher. It's, but it's one of the most uh, colorful flycatchers there is in the world, the many colored rush tyrant. And its habits are, are a little bit like a yellow throat. It's almost like they're in marshes and there's some aspect to them that reminds you of a yellow throat, even though they're flycatchers. And then down in South America in the far south, all of the meadowlark species have red breasts, not yellow breasts. So this is the long-tailed meadowlark, which actually does have a very long tail for, for a meadowlark. But um, otherwise, it's, um, it's, um, it doesn't act much like a meadowlark, but all you know, everything about it, otherwise genetics and so forth, is very clearly a meadowlark, long-tailed meadowlark. There's a convergence of some species where I showed you the nuthatch earlier that we see in California. Um, this is another furnariate, another oven bird that acts like a nuthatch. And in fact, if you look at the body and the bill shape, it's very much like a nuthatch in terms of its shape and its structure. And it's called the white-throated tree runner. The, the one thing it doesn't do is it never goes down the tree trunk. It always goes up more like a, like a brown creeper but it's, it's the same size and the same body shape as a nuthatch is actually kind of amazing to see because you, other than the color, you would think it was a nuthatch just from the way it, it, it looks in its body shape. And switching to, um, to Spain now, to really the Mediterranean, there are so many wonderful places to go birding in Spain. And if, if you've birded in, in Europe, Spain, you know, the, the southern parts of Europe are really the birdiest parts of, of the continent. And uh, I would say that Spain with its, um, the number of species you can see there and the migration, as well as Israel on the other side with the number of species you can see there and the migration are two of the most outstanding spots um, in, in the Western Palearctic to go 
birding. This is uh, the first place I ever went to in Spain is Monfragüe National Park um, in the Extremadura region, which is a few hours, you know, towards Portugal from uh, Madrid and not too far away from the uh, city of Trujillo. Um, beautiful spot, lots of great birds. Um, over there, instead of, you know, our sparrows, you have buntings. This is the rock bunting, which uh, just uh, nice, nice looking birds. Um, it, and this one was coming to see that somebody had set right, right next to the, the parking lot. Um, Trujillo is um, a beautiful town that has sort of, you, you can say layers of history. In fact, some of the buildings are built on the, the Moorish, you know, bottom sort of, uh, all the ruins of buildings, you know, from Moorish beginnings to, you know, older and this and that there. It's just uh, anybody who knows about architecture and history um, will can take you through a tour of Trujillo and teach you a lot about all of the different people that went through that part of the world and the, um, the wars and so forth. And it, but it's also full of birds or even right in town, you know, there are swifts and, and storks and raptors all flying around this, this beautiful town. So you, you can sit there and actually, you know, drink coffee or drink a beer in the square. And, you know, before you know it, you've seen 25 species of birds flying over. And one of the most um, um, vivid, big, showy ones is the white stork. And they nest, you know, on the buildings all over the place. And as you know, there's the, the tales of the white storks are the birds that bring the babies. Um, you know, because they were always around in the summer and, you know, they, you could see why people thought, okay, if, you know, if you had to make a story about where babies come from, stork was a good one to blame it on. I just wanted to, to <laughs> show, I mean, it's probably too heavy for a stork to carry, um, but I wanted to show you this really, really, really funny, weird paper that I found actually published in the scientific literature in 2004, and it's new evidence for the theory of the stork, and it's in the Pediatric and Perinatal Epi Epidemiology Journal. And what they say is, if you look at the number of births, so this is the number of births over the year, and the number of storks, which have been increasing over time, in, in, this is in, in Berlin, Germany, there's no correlation between number of storks and number of births. But if you restrict yourself only to home births, those that are not in the hospital, which of course the stork doesn't get into the hospital, the number of storks actually totally predicts the number of births in, in, in non-hospital births. So they, they make the argument that maybe the storks actually do bring babies, <laughs> or at least, at least I thought this was really funny, but it was published. Um, so there you go. Maybe maybe it's fake news, <laughs> but but it, it's out there. One of one of the things that for me was really interesting about um, um, being in Spain is that I'm I was born in Chile, right? Which is you know a, a country where you you most of the the people that that colonized that part of the world were from Spain, and there were all sorts of little inklings of this um, connection between Chile and especially the Extremadura region of, of Spain. See, Extremadura at, you know, several hundred years ago was the poorest part of Spain and people didn't have much of a future. And a lot of people joined up to go and essentially join the ships to go out to the new world and conquer the new world. So most of the conquistadors were from Extremadura. And in fact, if you think of this town called Trujillo, there's a city of Trujillo, which is much, much bigger in Peru, um, named for this city because the person who, you know, went and, and established that post in Peru was from the town of Trujillo in Spain. Um, and one of the things that really struck me was, you know, for example, um, I've I had family that lived in the city of Valdivia and Pedro de Valdivia is the, he was the, the Spanish conquistador that founded the city I was born in, Santiago. He was also one of the original earliest Spanish to, to go and, and, and you know, um, to, to Chile. And when one of my birding trips and the first time I was in Spain, we went through the village 
of Valdivia, which was this little tiny, tiny village. And I thought, could it be that this is where Pedro de Valdivia, who's had this, such an influence in the history of Chile, was from? And sure enough, that's where he was from. And it, it was um, even the accent of when I was talk, speaking in Spanish and some of the people from that part of Spain recognized my accent as being similar to an Extremadura accent in Spain because they said, well, you are all descendants of Spanish from Extremadura. Of course, the reality is that, you know, people like me from Chile are descendant partially from the Spanish and partially from the native population um, of Chile, like this woman who's a Mapuche native from the south and this, this region of the lakes region of Chile, exactly where my family's from. And it's, uh, it's cool that now I've been able to do my deal found out that I'm two thirds, um, two thirds a European, much of it Spanish and one third Mapuche from. So I'm basically a person who's part conqueror, part conquered. <laughs> and uh, it really was interesting for me to go to Spain and, and learn all these things and put it all together. I, before I went there, I really didn't have a connection to the place and it became so much more vivid. And then there's all those great birds, of course. Um, the other thing I learned was that the hedge mustard is this yellow flower that's you know makes those mustard fields and it's called jaramago, and a field full of mustard is called a jaramillo. That is my last name. So my name my name me means a field full of mustard. So you could call me Mr. Mustard next time if you have problem <laughs> pronouncing my name. But as you go birding there, raptors are, are one of the the greatest uh, you know aspects of birding in Spain and the migration of raptors. These are griffin, vultures. Um, each one of uh, these regions also has a special vulture. You know, the, in, if we think about Africa with a you know, lapid-faced vulture, California with the California condor, griffins in, in Spain and Indian condors in, in Chile. So every one of these Mediterranean regions has good vultures. And in Spain, you also have great bustards, which are um, an amazing, you know, huge, huge bird that when you see them in spring doing, I, I mean, they're often far away, so I, I apologize for this photo, but when they're doing the displays, they sort of almost like, it's like they turn themselves inside out, like these big white fluffs are the males actually kind of bringing all of the feathers up, you know, around their body as they do their displays. These were young males, so they were practicing their displays. So there's some really neat birds in Spain, um, bustards and uh, sand grouse, the lesser kestrel, which is a colonial kestrel that nests right in those old buildings in a place like Trujillo or swifts. Uh, there are alpine swifts like this. They're really big swifts, the alpines, uh, as, as well as common swifts and pallet swifts that you can see right in town. Um, here's a lesser kestrel and a booted eagle, a lot of uh, different types of uh, uh, eagles and raptor, um, you know, hawks that they call buzzards over there as well, and honey buzzards, as um, which I'll I think I'll show you in a minute, honey buzzard. And um, some birds that I always, always wanted to see, like uh, Pratt and Coles. Pratt and Coles are almost like, um, a, if you took a shorebird, like a sandpiper, and you mixed it with a swallow, that's roughly what you get. Um, they, in fact, they fly more like a swift. They're a, a and they will fly catch like swifts. Then they sit down in a little flock by a mud flat and kind of look like shorebirds. They are related to shorebirds, but just fantastic birds. And I always think that one day if, if a Pratt and Cole landed anywhere in the US as a vagrant, which will happen, it would probably cause such a stir that everybody would be flying all over the place to, to go see them. I'm, I'm hoping it's gonna be, you know, right here in Half Moon Bay that we, we get a Pratt and Cole from from Asia, but probably more likely that one's going to show up in the East Coast in Cape May or something. Um, the Strait of Gibraltar, which as you can see down here, you know, it divides Europe from Africa, is not that wide. You know, it's, it's uh, I think it's, let's say like 10 miles um, uh, wide, 16 kilometers, something like that. And these raptors and storks and a lot of these birds um, have to migrate through here. The raptors do it in the day. And it is quite incredible to see like these um, um, honey buzzards in spring coming along and booted eagles and griffin vultures and so forth. And they really are not 
good at crossing water. Like they really cannot handle that much flapping. And you will see some birds that the moment they get to land, they'll just drop down and sit there and pant. And we even saw one bird that was so tired by the time it was trying to get through that its wings were hitting the water, you know, for, for about you know, two minutes before it got onto land. And it, it's, it's kind of, it's shocking to see because you always think that raptors are, you know, they're, you know, 10 miles wouldn't be that much of a big deal, but it really is. It's actually quite shocking for some of these birds. I mean, peregrine falcon could do it no problem, but um, for some of these migrants and they don't have many choices. It's either go through here or go through Israel or maybe hopscotch on the islands, you know, sort of south of uh, Italy. And those are the main three migration points for a lot of birds uh, coming into Europe. And it can be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of raptors of various species. So it's a highly recommended to go and see the, the migration for Alter. Um, and uh, South Africa is um, really quite different from the rest of Africa, especially the Cape region has all of these endemic plants, endemic insects, all sorts of stuff that's found nowhere else. And many of, many of these species are sort of um, Gondwana age plants and that, that were around before Africa became um, um, sort of a separate continent. Uh, Cape Town's a beautiful place. Um, also great, great place for birding. And uh, you can get to see things like the Malachite Thumbbird, which uh, is, Although some birds are often thought to be a little bit like hummingbirds, they're really, really different. Although they, they you know, eat nectar like our hummingbirds, they're quite different and, and amazing in their own way. So here's two other sunbirds, southern double colored and the orange breasted sunbird, multiple species that you can see. They love this kind of flower, like the, this is a kind of mint um, species. And uh, some things are out there that you just don't, you, you know, you look through the book and you don't expect they're gonna be so showy, but the real things are really, really, really cool. Like speckled pigeon, which was just, you know, in, in the parking lots, you know, walking around in, in the Cape region. The other thing unexpected for me was uh, diversity of siskins and canaries and some of them quite rare uh, or very specific to certain habitats and, and many species that are nomadic in, in southernmost Af Africa. So you know, you're lucky to see some of these things. Others are more common. This is the Cape Siskin and the Forest Canary. And, and there are other species as well. Then um, like the great bustard in Spain, there are smaller bustards um, in, in this part of Africa, the black bustard or the, it's also called the black Corhan was a, was a nice find. And um, it's cool to see these families that we just don't have in North America. And that's one of the great things about travel in general is just sort of uh, things that you've just seen in the book and, and to see the real thing, how they move and what they sound like and all of that is just such a, an experience. Um, and for me, going to South Africa, uh, one of the things I really wanted to see was the, the mammals and there's the Cape region, but we also visited just outside, uh, you know, we flew a couple of hours out to Durban, which is not really in the Mediterranean region per se, but I th thought I would show you that, you know, you cannot go to this part of the world without going and trying to see some of these, you know, doing safari type uh, situation, see zebras and cheetahs and, you know, lions. And uh, the lions, when they would go close to the vehicle, they, they really don't, they're not scared of vehicles and they're not interested in them. They just sort of ignore them. It's, it's funny. They, you know, you, the one thing you're, you're told to do is don't stand up so they sh that you look like a, an animal <laughs> sort of standing outside of the general sort of square nature of the vehicle. But when, when the lion goes by, their eyes, um, they're, they're really scary looking. <laughs> they really look like something that just sends a chill through you. And, and it's, it's wonderful to experience. And I, and I also, knowing that you're safe too, um, I thought, you know, people have been living with lions since people started. You know, we people came from Africa. And I wondered if that chill was something we we're just born with at this point in time, that we have, you know, we started from this part of the world 
and we see the eyes of the lion and it is scary like <laughs> like a way that's you know it's beautiful but scary you know and yeah i i i really felt that of the from the lions um a total aside you know i as i've traveled through these places i often thought it was weird that you know here we can see a pintail a shoveler and a widgeon um, you go to Spain and there's the same pintail, shoveler, different widgeon, different kind of teal, for example, but there's still sort of the same elements. You go to Chile and there's a Chiloé widgeon, a red shoveler, a yellow-billed pintail, sort of the similar kind of things. And there's also a yellow-billed teal, which is like a green wing, but um, brown plumage. South Africa, there's a shoveler. The red-billed teal is essentially a pintail. And then there's other ducks that are like the teal and so forth. They don't have a widgeon, but it's funny how these recur. And I, I don't know why that is. I just sort of point it out. You go, because ducks are a good portion of, of the species you will see in these places. And they sort of repeat in term, at least the types. And then there's also oddball ducks, like things that just don't fit at all. Like um, this uh, white back duck over here um, and black headed duck and the marbled, um, a duck marble teal from Spain. This is African. This is Chilean over here. Um, this guy, who's not very special looking, is one of the most special birds on, in the world in just one way. It's the only bird on earth that is like a cowbird. It lays its eggs in the nests of another bird in an obligate way. It always does that. It never makes its own nests and cares for its own young, but it's the only one that has precocial young. So the young chicks pop out the little ducklings, they can swim on their own and they go off on their own. So they don't need to be fed. All they need is incubation. So the black headed duck lays its eggs in the nest of coots, snail kites, ibis, all sorts of things. All it needs is a warm body to sit on the eggs and then the duck can survive from that. It's kind of a special duck. No other bird on earth is obligate brood parasite and has precocial young. There are some birds found in all of these areas, and I'll show you a little bit about migration in a sec before before I finish. You know, peregrines, ospreys, egrets, you know, um, barn swallows. Many of them are migratory, and um, things like the barn swallow. You know, migrate uh, from different north to south, different places. I wanted to show you something about barn swallow, though. If you look at um, Washington State, birds banded uh, and tracked from Washington State. And this is probably similar to our California birds. They go to Mexico and Central America to winter. And the further east you go, so if you're here in New Brunswick, the further south they go. So the ones that winter in South America are in fact from New Brunswick or Ontario, while further west, they're uh, wintering in Central America or Mexico. And that pattern repeats itself over and over and over again in warblers and swallows and different things. So most of our swallows are probably going to um, Mexico. And um, showed you a little, little weird thing here too. Barn swallows have started to breed in the last few decades in Argentina. And uh, now cliff swallows have started to breed there. And now this year, there's also a cliff swallow breeding in Chile. And this is brand new. And fortunately, they've been able to track some of these birds. And it was a thought that maybe these Argentine birds were actually wintering in the US and Canada, but they're not. They're actually going to northernmost South America. Now we know this from all of this new technology that we have. Barn swallows in Europe also great migrants and similar things. When you look at the ones further into Eastern Europe, they fly further south than the ones in England and Northern Europe that go um, more to Central Africa. And the greatest migrant, I think, is the common swift, one of the birds that you can find in Trujillo nesting in those buildings. The, the ones from Europe will be migrating down, you know, into Africa. And there are also populations all the way from Asia that are coming, crossing the entire kind of old world to winter in Africa. And this happens too with cuckoos. Common cuckoos will migrate from all the way from China to Africa. But the most incredible thing about common swifts is the moment they leave their breeding area, so they, they're nesting in these buildings and so on, you know, just like a regular swift does in a funny way. Once they leave that nesting area, they don't actually land at all 
until they go back to the nesting area the next spring. So they are flying nonstop between the time they leave. Let's say this one is, you know, in, in London and it goes down to Africa. It will not actually land again until it goes back to London in the spring. It stays flying all day, all night for months at a time. And that's gotta be the most amazing thing I've ever heard of. And that's been confirmed now. And they just feed, you know, on, on flying insects, move around and they go higher elevation at night and may you know, sleep on the wing, come down nonstop. And these migrants affect the habitat, uh, believe it or not, some birds will take seeds and little, you know, uh, from one place to the other. One local um, plant that you could think of, the beech strawberry, has a really, really separate di disjunct distribution, almost like that magpie, where they're in coastal Western North America and Chile. And it's thought that they were brought back and forth um, by Wimbrel. And Wimbrel may be the reason these, this, this species or some other shorebird, but Wimbrel seems to be the most logical given its migratory routes going right through from um, California, Alaska to Chile. And there's also some plants like the little sundew that's found very commonly in Alaska and also common, uh, at least in high elevations in parts of Hawaii. And those two plants are probably brought there by uh, uh, Pacific golden plovers, uh, perhaps. Um, Michael Park, one of the local birders here in the Bay Area has been studying this and he uh, thinks that bared sandpipers in fact have moved grasses and other plants from cent Central North America to Argentina and Chile uh, in their migration. So these birds really have, um, have affected their habitat um, through the migration and taking seeds. Now, I think, you know, you probably would imagine that person that spends so much time with the ocean, I was gonna end with the ocean stories. All of these places I've, I've talked about are great for seabirds really. And um, you can go to South Africa and Cape of Good Hope and see the Cape petrel, which is a, actually an Antarctic breeding species, but named for the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa is where it gets its name because that's where a lot of sailors used to see them going around the Cape. So it's the Cape petrel. And these areas that have the blue cold water currents are called Eastern boundary currents. These are the great spots for seabirds where the cold water comes down further towards the equator than you would expect in, you know, sort of just from our um, latitude. So California, Chile, South Africa, the coast um, you know, of Spain, we have also um, in Australia. So they're really closely associated with the places that are Mediterranean zones. And this is where we have the upwelling and the currents that are bringing in food from other places. And we get the masses and masses of birds and whales, like all these sooty shearwaters. And that cool ocean air that's adjacent to these Mediterranean areas is the perfect habitat for grapes that need cold at night, like many of the whites and Pinot Noir. And um, it's, it's not, um, it, in, in a sense, uh, you can see why these things uh, work out in Chile and California, given that we have this cold air that will come in at night to cool down the place. And also the reason we have birds from further north, like these, like this um, um, fulmar in, here in, in California that comes down to our latitude, it's because we have cold water. Um, this is the famous Southern's albatross we saw in California some years ago and you think, well, that's really lost and crazy and what a find, but in fact, it went exactly to the right habitat because this is the type of habitat you see Salvins and all of its relatives in. So this, this is a Salvins um, here in Chile, uh, Chatham albatross and the white caps. So these are all relatives uh, in the same group and you can see white caps in South Africa. You can see the Chatham and Salamence and Chile, and they take the same water temperature, the same type of place that we saw the, the um, Salamence over here in, in, in California. So it's, it's a matter of time before others show up, other species that like this same kind of habitat. How could Africa have penguins? Because they have cold water. So African penguins are one of the birds you'd go and look for in, in the Cape region and uh, very closely related to Magellanic penguins from Chile. And in fact, if you look 
this one, this is a classic African penguin. It has only one band. I found one African penguin that had two bands like this, and it's just kind of an oddball, but it almost mimicked the Magellanic penguins pattern. But it's just an oddball, um, not a hybrid or anything. And for us here, we don't have penguins, but man, it's, it's not a bad trade to have these beautiful birds, alcids. Now we don't have horn puffins here in California, but um, we have a variety of, of alcids, tufted puffins and further north, the horn puffin. Every so often we get a horn puffin. Um, the white chin petrel in California, again, you go to other parts, uh, water that's similar off of South Africa or Chile, white chin petrels there are very common. It's the same kind of habitat, same type of water temperature, same color of water, sometimes a similar anchovies that they're eating. And uh, I'll just point out that in, in the Pacific, the chin is very, very restricted. In the Atlantic, the chin is actually a little bit bigger on white chin petrels. So it's not the best name for the bird though. And you know, one of the things I do is I take people birding and all this when you can travel. Of course, you know, we're, we're still um, not traveling, but, you know, seeing sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and people always ask, well, what is a birding and wine tour? How do you do this? And one of the things we do is, well, we, we know that birding, you want to get up early, go birding and so forth. And, and there we have birding days and wine and food days. We sort of separate them out so that there are days that we can sleep in and, and go and have these nice local meals and try an amazing variety of wines. You know, we, uh, we uh, you know, I think the checklist of wines that we have on some of these wine trips is as high as <laughs> the bird checklist, given how many different things we try. And it's good fun. And, you know, like, you got to be careful. You don't want to end up like this guy, you know, got to pace yourself. It's, it's about tasting the wine, not, you know, going crazy on it. Uh, but uh, it, it's worked out very well. We've had some really, really fun trips um, um, doing this mix of nature, photography, wine, food, and gives you a much more perspective on, on places. And you have a little slower time to see places like Trujillo and understand a little bit about the culture as well as the birds and the natural history. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a mix of things, you know, maybe not what would, if you wanna rack up the biggest list a quickest, you know, maybe it's not the best trip, but we certainly see a ton of diversity and we also um, enjoy the place and enjoy the food and enjoy the people. So um, hopefully we'll be able to do Spain and Morocco this year if, if, if things kind of get a little bit better, but otherwise next year, you know, birds and wine in Chile and Argentina uh, should happen in South Africa. And um, I just wanted to point out too, this next week, I've got a sparrow workshop. If anybody's interested, you can email me at, um, it's uh, at alvaro at alvarosadventures.com. And uh, also, if you go to my website, alvarosadventures.com, you can find out about other trips coming up this uh, year, Hawaii, you know, Galapagos uh, later on in, in the season. And again, it's gonna depend a little bit about um, where we can travel, how, how we can do it. But, you know, Hawaii is in the US and they've been doing very well with, with maintaining their COVID numbers low. So it, it, I'm hoping that that one, that one works out. It'd be great to be able to get people out there watching birds as we uh, are eventually going to kind of get out of this situation. So I'm very optimistic and hopeful, of course, but all right, I think uh, I can take questions. I, um, Thank you so much, everybody. It's so weird to give these talks where you don't see anybody's, you know, everybody's face, you know, and, and all that, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Thank you, Alvaro. That's really awesome. A number of people have written to the chat. Tom, do you, did you want to monitor the chat? Um, some of it is thanks. Um, we had our record number of attendees. We had 68 mm -hmm. at one point, Alvaro, so you're very popular. I must admit, I was I voted for your slideshow on Chile, and I was uh -huh. a little apprehensive about the Mediterranean regions of the world and wine. But uh, it turned out it was a very fascinating talk. I, I really enjoyed it immensely. Hey, well, next time we can do Chile. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Tom, do you want to uh, monitor the chat? Were there any questions there? Um, you're, you're, everybody needs to turn their sound on, uh, 
I don't know if I can turn your sound on. Um, ask, I'm Tom, I'm asking you to unmute. Can you hear me? Keep unmuting and then I keep getting go. muted. Not, now, you're good. now you're good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think uh, most of the, the, the uh, chat is, is uh, compliments about the, uh, uh, the different sections of the talk. Uh, people uh, like the weather pattern information. Uh, there, there was right at the start you had, yeah, I don't think it was a truca, but it was it was a, a bird, I think, from Chile. Uh, the truca, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 I, I was just wondering when I saw it, the tail was up. That, it, it's uh, from the Wren family, I think you said later on. No, it, it's um, it's the Tapaculo family, which I, they're, um, most of the Tapaculos are like Wrens, actually. Very small, little brownish or, or grayish things with stick-up tails. Okay. But the turca is this massive, big kind of quail-sized thing. And they're, they're, that family's not found here. So they're, you know, it's hard to describe, you know, they're, they're not quite ant birds. They're not quite oven birds. They're these tapaculos. And for the most part, most tapaculos are really unassuming, but in, in the far South, Chile and Argentina has these big, bold, showy, um, you know, ones that sometimes walk around in, in the open. So they're, they're kind of the, the fancy ones. Mustache turca is the official name. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, someone has asked if you could explain a little more about your sparrow workshop. Yeah. Um, the, well, the idea is um, mostly bird identification. It's it, a sparrow identification, but it's uh, broad in scope, and that we're going to look at sparrows for the you know the entire North American continent with a Western bias, I would say, and f less information on the things that are really rare unusual or you know like Bachman sparrows just you know mm -hmm. sort of show them mostly but more on the the things that are day-to-day -day, you know song versus Lincoln's versus Fox versus you know how do you identify these things a little bit on song although um, um, it's it's a big topic so we'll we'll get in, into some of the biology of the song and as well as how you can use it for ID um, I think uh, my friend Mandy, who's leading the the trip in in Hawaii, she's she's on here. I think she posted the info somewhere on the chat. So, hmm. yeah, great. I want to uh, before people leave, I want to thank Barbara Navalonic, who's on our board, who has set up all of our presentations this year. She's done a marvelous job, and uh, I wanted to give her special thanks for all of her hard work uh, organizing. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Um, anything else, Tom, from the chat? Uh, no, just uh, people uh, commenting as a very excellent talk. Uh, All oh, right. I, I was have... really blown away by how similar the different uh, locations were in terms of bird species. I mean, or bird types, I guess is yeah. the best way to say it. Um, and that was the point of what you did is like, wow, and they're endemic, particularly to a lot of those spots. Yeah. I wanted to ask a little more about that because I, I, I liked your comment about like these birds that were like doppelgangers in uh -huh. the limited traveling that I've done looking at birds and I looked at some birds in the Mediterranean. I was struck by that. I kept thinking it's like I'm in a parallel universe where it's the same birds, but they're different. Yeah. And, and, and that's just, you know, sort of anecdotal, like my observations, but I'm wondering how much research has been done. Like, are the are there connections between these doppelganger birds um, that go? Is there any way to sort of trace that in terms of evolution? Yeah, there there is because if you if you have two things that are similar and they're closely related, right? You know, you can get a situation where you um, you can get sort of a parallel evolution in that they are you know they yeah. are related or whatever. But you can also get I think the most interesting thing is when you get something that is not related to something else. So that white-throated tree runner, it's not related genetically. We know that we, people have done multiple studies, not related. Yeah. They both act like nuthatches. So they're converging on a type, right? So, and, yeah, and, so is that, and that's a response sometimes just to the environment that they have the same the, problems that they're dealing with, is that? To the environment and, and you wonder if, like the question for me is like, why wouldn't you just become some other crazy thing that picks around in, <laughs> you know, in, in on, on trees? And it has to do 
sometimes with whether it's tropical versus temperate. So we, we have right. some of these things that sort of show up in temperate regions as fewer niches, it seems that in tropical regions. And maybe there's only a couple of ways you can be effectively a good bird at poking around and bark, you know, and in a temperate region. So you get end up getting a nuthatch and maybe a creeper kind of situation. While in yeah. tropical regions, there can be like the, you know, the wood creepers and the xenops and all these other oddball things that are taking a broader set of um, niches that are available. And um, I, I think, you know, I've been blown away sometimes when I birded in Chile a long time, there are a raptor, it's a caracara called a chimango caracara. Yeah. And yeah. it's a brown thing and it's, you know, but they're common. They're all over the place, even in towns. They sometimes roost communally. They, they um, hang around, you know, areas around, you know, where there's fast food and so forth, picking around and stuff, really versatile. And I'm thinking, this thing doesn't act like a raptor. It's, n it's not like the caracara as we know. And there was a moment in time where I was like, oh my God, this is a crow. This is <laughs> the version of the crow, but it's not related. It's not at all related. Similarly, a few years ago, there's this flycatcher called a white monjita, and it's all white and black. It's one of the most beautiful. It's really white, like almost like snowy all white. And they perch on wires and or top of trees, and they drop down to the ground to eat, you know, and then come up to the wire again. And you're so blown away by this white bird that you, you almost don't pay attention to what it's doing. And there was, a, again, moment where I said, oh, my God, this is a bluebird. Yeah. It's acting just like a bluebird, but it's a flycatcher and it's a white looking flycatcher. And, and it is really exciting for me to sort of see those connections. And they are, it's just sort of one of those things. Like, it's like there, there is something that some birds just coalesce to a type and it happens over and over and over and over again, like convergent to a type. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Type a. <laughs> really, a technical question in that light um is there a relationship between chickadees and tits are they oh yeah they're related same they are related. Yeah. yeah so some so, of them yeah, are related yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah yeah okay yeah. they're related so that but but then you you ask the question like oh sorry i, I was gonna say it does make sense that given the same environment and the same types of trees like oak trees that the birds would converge if they weren't the same species they would converge because you know their their form mm -hmm. performs a certain function and in those habitats the food is in a particular place so the their their food gathering techniques you would think might converge uh, right it makes sense right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah and and then then there are other things that, you know, when, when you start looking at, at birds more in this concept of the evolution of types and things. So you just mentioned tits and chickadees. They're related. Mm -hmm. They have the white cheeks and they have, but why are the, the European tits so bright in color? Gray tit, blue tit, a lot of them are actually very colorful. And the Japanese yeah. berry tit, they have all this, and why are chickadees relatively dull? And there might be a reason for that. It might be genes, it might be, you know, because they come from a dull line of, you know, or there's an environmental reason. And one other pattern that's kind of cool is if you look at woodpeckers in the temperate regions, they often have black and white patterns, right? With, with the classic hairy woodpecker, nautilus woodpecker, whatever are black and white. Relatives of those black and white uh, woodpeckers in the tropics, have green patterns. They often are green and buff. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Chile and Argentina, again, in the temperate regions, they're black and white. And the ones that look like downy woodpeckers in the south are not related to the ones we have here, but are related to these tropical green things. And you think like, why is it that woodpeckers go green in the tropics? Why, <laughs> you know, is it because the bark looks different? And I think that's probably it. Yeah. The bark of the trees looks different. It didn't get it's you. a beautiful way to think about the world this way. You start kind of all these questions. You can't answer them all, but they're interesting to ponder, I think. Yeah. Something they're... has to brighten up Britain a little bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Britain 
has, but they have those beautiful, the J's in Britain are awesome, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love our J's too, but. Yeah, no, the J's, J's are good at all over. The brown oh. J's a little bit like, you know, uh, loud and brown, <laughs> they're not, they're not so fancy, but. I love all Corvids. I don't care if they're fancy yeah. or not. They're all great. <laughs> So Alra, do you, do you think that the Galapagos trip in 2021 is going to run? I I think so. I, the the um, people in the Galapagos uh, that that I work with are they say that uh, tourism is already started. Like there are people going to the Galapagos already, and they have um, regimes of testing, you know, for COVID and so forth, which are happening now. But of course, I think by the time June rolls around, it'll be a little bit better. <laughs> Assuming, you know, so, so, you, can, you, know, you can only be optimistic with all this stuff that's going yeah. on. So, so if I were to register um, then, and it didn't go, then we go next time? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Just optimistic. Yeah. I'm, yeah, but I thanks for asking. That. It's a cool place. Oh, I might just do it. <laughs> when yeah. is the Hawaii trip? June. I it's in April. Um, I think Man Mandy might have posted... Uh, yeah, something on the Galapagos. Yeah, and you know she, she's she's actually leading it, so she's kind of the, April of the, this the Hawaii year. birding pro. So uh, Mandy Talpas. So she. That's April of this year. Uh, yeah. Okay, because I know there's like a two week quarantine. Well, I, no, I, not anymore. I think it's changing. Mm -hmm. they just, just, they just perhaps a negative COVID tests now. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to do too much Hawaii talk on the California chat, but thanks for the plug, Alvaro. And um, yes, you can completely skip quarantine as of right now. All you need to do is get a, a COVID test before you fly in. And if anybody's interested, just reach out to myself or Alvaro and we can help you out. Perfect. Hey, you. Uh, Mark, do you have any questions for Alvaro before we uh, begin to shut down? I, I had one thing, Mark, uh, the, the chat, can you copy that? Uh, and there's some uh, Maybe. Uh, links on here that I'd like to, to just post to people following if you, you. If you're recording it, I think it, it'll it um, it'll oh, yeah. uh, send you the chat um, oh, as the a text or something later from my experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. I just took I, a screenshot, so I at least have uh, some of it here. Yeah. Um, anyway, everybody, thanks so much for your interest, and it's uh, it's nice to see birders. <laughs> you know, it's nicer to do this live, um, <laughs> but uh, we're 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 doing this, and we sometimes get to reach more people by doing it this way, which is great. And oh, there's a, I saw a wine wine glass of wine there. There we go. <laughs> Salud, Susan. Salud. <laughs> I'm curious, Alvaro. In Giglio. Some of our sessions we haven't. Uh, muted people, uh, but I think it was easier to hear you with most everyone muted. So I don't know. It might have been strange for you not to hear our giggles and uh, yeah. and laughing over your jokes. But uh, yeah, like there were some funny moments. <laughs> I I try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep it light, you know. <laughs> yeah. I want to read that article about the storks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I can send you send me an email or something and I can find the article. It's, it's weird. <laughs> it's funny. That is a great thing. So coming up next month, uh, Wendy Shakowitz will be on uh, Thursday, February the 11th. And then we on February the 20th, uh, if COVID restrictions are lifted, we will have a field trip to consume this. Um, what is it? Uh, not rec area it's a consumist wildlife center so is that to watch crane down uh some cranes and uh some other things as well yeah that's a wonderful place for crane down yes right great well thank you everyone for coming crane thank down. you alvaro it was a great talk and uh thank you we look forward to having you back all right and, uh, with our poultry uh, honorarium but uh, we will send that <laughs> to you <laughs> <laughs> enough to buy some wine right? thank right. you so much thank you